much, Chris. Um, I'm not, I actually haven't done much of this talking to lots of people and stuff, so it's fairly nerve-wracking. Um, and one of the things I've been trying to do is that whole visualise the audience as being naked and stuff, but I've, <laughs> I've had a lot of trouble, um, I've had a lot of trouble with that visualisation thing, so I just like you to all take your clothes off. <laughs> me to talk here and well and being here in general so I'd like to thank them because it's been fantastic the last few days and it's been absolutely amazing. <laughs> and so uh, uh, I think if I remember rightly Roger and Ollie asked me to um, talk about social media or something and um, <laughs> so this is what I've come up with. There's a problem with social media and that's when doctors hear those two words, they kind of run away. And so one of the ways, well, so I'm not going to talk about social media. I'm going to talk about phone. Okay. So let's get cracking. Now, um, you've heard my talks before. I have no financial disclosures to make. I'm as pure as Charlie Sheen's smack. The, um, <laughs> And all the stuff that I talk about here tonight, it's all free, it's all open access, it's all about, you know, making the world a better place, so let's rock on. Um, the reason why I'm here is because with uh, Mike Cadogan, he's the short, bald guy with wearing the hat. Yeah, that's right. And um, uh, together with him, I'm involved in a free online medical education project called lifeinthefarsane.com. And um, also, many of you have met my little boy, Oscar. He's given up on ECGs, now he likes to levitate over ancient monoliths. Um, uh, but the most important person is the person who took that photo, who I wouldn't be able to do any of this stuff, and this was for Micah, so thank you. Now, the problem with giving a presentation is that, um, from what I've read, 99% of them suck. And um, so I've got to somehow try and squeeze this into the 1%. And so what I thought I'd do to start off with was a literature review. And um, so <laughs> to, to try and help me out with this. And I found it was what I thought was I'll search PubMed and I'll search sure. for how to give an unforgettable talk. And this is what I came up with. Um, I, I found a paper in a journal, I've almost forgotten the name of it now, I think it's, um, yeah, I've forgotten it, it's um, <laughs> some urology journal, and it was called How to Give an Unforgettable Talk, or something along those lines, and what it was, it was kind of a memoir by this guy called Lawrence Klotz, who in the 80s um, went to a, a, the Eurodynamics Society conference in Las Vegas, and in retrospect, the main event was this guy, yes. Professor Giles Brindley from the UK, who um, was a noted musicologist and physiologist who subsequently received a knighthood, not for his public speaking, as it turns out. Um, so it, it kind of starts off with um, uh, Klotz is uh, on his way to the conference, and he's in the left. It's a crowded left, and he's looking around, and he sees this bespectacled um, uh, older gentleman who's wearing a tracksuit and he's holding this little cigar case and he's got it open and he's sort of twitching side to side and he's flicking through all these slides in there and um, <laughs> Klotz actually gets a glimpse of some of these slides and goes, this is Brindley, uh, this is the man himself, but he's thinking, why the tracksuit? <laughs> it will be revealed. The, um, so anyway, they move on, they part ways and um, Klotz takes his seat. I think he's in the third row of this conference and just in front of him there's all the very prominent urologists and their elegantly dressed wives sitting in the front two rows. And uh, then, um, uh, <laughs> then uh, Brindley takes the stage and he's still wearing the tracksuit. And Brindley steps up and he says, what I'm going to talk to you about today, there's no good human models for. And for this reason, I've had to do these experiments on myself. Now, we know that in Australia, you win Nobel Prizes for this sort of stuff. You know? 
But Brinkley wasn't studying helicobacter pylori and uh, gastritis. He was uh, working on treatments for erectile impotence. Anyone want to see the next slide? <laughs> So, as, um, as Brindley gave his talk, he put his slides Turnips. up, and what it consisted of, the first 30 or so, so slides were basically pictures of his own, um, part of his anatomy, getting progressively larger, and progressively more erect. Um, so that by the time they got to the, um, the, uh, <laughs> the 30th slide, the audience, they were convinced, you know, man, he's onto something, this stuff is working. But Brindley, he's, he was a real scientist. He recognised, for instance, that um, there'll be people there who'll be thinking, you know, how do we know that there wasn't some sort of erotic stimulation that, that helped achieve these magnificent results? How do we know it was just the drug? So that's when Brindley revealed that just before he'd come to the conference, he'd injected himself. Because no one would find standing in front of a big audience talking as any sort of erotic stimulation. Oh, sorry, there's one more. So, at this point, Brindley stood from behind the lectern and started pulling his tracksuit pants up like this to try and demonstrate how effective his treatment was. And, you know, every, everyone in the audience was still convinced that, yeah, it's great, it's great, it works, we believe you, we believe, we believe you, from. But he looked down and he wasn't so impressed. So, oh, there's another one. Um, <laughs> so, it was at this point, in a stroke of true genius, that Brindley just dropped his pants. And the audience was agog, because what stood before them was truly impressive, I, I suppose. But again, <laughs> Brindley knew there would be sceptics in the audience. And it was at this point, he suggested that the true proof would be to well, some people, you know, most people think seeing is believing, but Brindley thought that no, <laughs> some people won't believe it until they've actually tested the degree of tumescence for themselves. At which point, <laughs> at which point he started with his um, hands around his ankles, <laughs> sort of <laughs> walking like this down the steps into the audience towards the um, prominent neuro urologists and their el elegantly dressed wives, who then just started screaming in unison. <laughs> and at this point, um, Brindley realised that some people were shocked. <laughs> and he started uh, making his way back to the lectern and kind of the whole audience disbanded in sort of this flabbergasted state. Uh, Soon after, the um, papers were published and a uh, new treatment for erectile impotence was born. Um, Paparavine injection into, into whatever that part of the penis you meant to inject it in. So, you don't need to be an Einstein to take lessons from this story. <laughs> the first one is probably um, giving an unforgettable talk is probably overrated. <laughs> The second one is that the traditional resources we use in medicine are probably also overrated and that there may be a better way to do things. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. So I gave up on PubMed and I decided to search the podcast database on life in the fastlane.com and this is what I came up with. Joe Lex's lecture on free emergency talks called How to Give a Damn Good Talk. Recommend it to anyone. Now, this whole experience of reading this paper wasn't wasted because I turned it into a blog post and stuck it on life in the fast lane. And why I'm mentioning this is that it's an example of the power of social media for knowledge translation 
I don't know anyone who read whatever that journal was I found that paper in. I don't know anyone who knew that story. But subsequent to, this was about five months ago that this was uh, published, that's 6,000 people who viewed this page. You know, it's something. Some more concrete examples. Um, uh, not so long ago, uh, Scott Weingart of MCRIT wrote a paper on what he calls delayed sequence intubation. Essentially, it's a uh, process of giving um, ketamine as procedural sedation to pre-oxygenate a patient before you intubate them. Tired. This paper was published online and nothing happened. He heard nothing. He decided to do a podcast on it on MCRIT and immediately the, the responses, some of them were probably abusive because not everyone thinks this is a good idea, but the, the post-publication peer, peer review process that he went through that we first admit was an amazing experience and helped refine the technique. And even people over in Perth, before this was published in print, were try, trying out this technique on patients and it was getting them out of big trouble. Another example, um, uh, Seth Truger in New York, who was a chief resident in emergency medicine at the time, um, uh, tweeted that his brother-in-law had a severely obese patient that they were having trouble getting a chest drain in. So he used a bougie so that they wouldn't lose the tract and um, put, the, put the chest tube in over the bougie and got it in nicely. Now, I'd actually done this about two years before. Someone else had told me the tip and I was in the same predicament and tried it. But at the time, I wasn't using social media. I never would have thought to have mentioned it. But the flurry of many very prominent emergency doctors and ICU type people that thought, well, that's interesting. And some people were thinking, nah, that doesn't work. It doesn't sound good. Um, but immediately another guy, Graham Walker in San Francisco, who was in the sim lab at the time, demonstrated on his, uh, on his mannequin and showed that, yeah, in theory it will work. And within half an hour after that, I put a blog on post on Life in the Fast Lane. And two days later, the whole thing was summarized on Michelle Lynn's academic life in emergency medicine. It's just an amazing tool for spreading ideas. I could go on and on and on. I don't, I'm not saying that these are revolutionary developments that are, you might not even think they're good ideas, but the, the ideas and how they evolve based on this is amazing. And um, my job here tonight really is to uh, make you get your head out, out of the sand and somehow, whether it's big or small, get involved in this thing that's happening um, because what happens when you get a whole lot of like-minded people sharing ideas and stuff online, collaborating, communicating, it's really quite fantastic. So one of the things I learned from Joe Lex's talk is that you need to know your audience and um, <laughs> your doctors. So that means when it comes to the dissemination of innovations, you are laggards, okay? And um, I gave a similar talk um, uh, at the ACE and Winter Symposium a couple of years ago. And to be honest, um, I felt a bit nervous about it because I was saying all this stuff and a lot of them hadn't really come to fruition. Uh, I felt like it was overstating the utility of a lot of these things. But now I, I have no concerns about that. This stuff is, is bloody awesome. And um, uh, the problem with doctors being laggards is that, you know, they like to have all the wrinkles ironed out. They like to have all the squeaks oiled out. And maybe there are still a few wrinkles and squeaks, but the stuff is really working. It's certainly working for me. Now, when you, I'm the same as everyone else. When I first encountered Twitter, social media stuff, I felt pretty uncomfortable. I felt a bit like um, how I would feel in this situation looking over the cliff. But once you get stuck in, it's really quite exhilarating to see what can happen. And the bottom line is, I really think it does work. It's amazing what people will do if you give them a free life in the fast lane t-shirt. <laughs> And, you know, I think it's about time that there is a revolution in how we do um, education and, um, and continuous learning in medicine. And there's a lot of other people who agree. In the New England Journal of Medicine, just in the last year, there was a, this paper published on lecture halls um, without lectures. And it's basically, um, together with some other stuff published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine on Web 2.0, which is really what social media is, um, 
this whole stuff, the free online sources, they really mesh in, mesh in with these concept of, concepts of asynchronous learning and flipping the classroom. So what we mean by asynchronous learning is, at the moment, the uh, classic situation is we all turn up to a lecture, there's maybe eight of us, and, um, uh, and someone gives a talk and we sit there and we try and stay awake in it, just like you're doing now. <laughs> yeah. A better way is to prepare these materials in advance, have them as videos, multimedia stuff, you can listen to them, riding your bike, watch it at home if you're a shift worker, doing it whenever it suits you. Then turn up at the you know in the lecture in the classroom and do simulation, have Socratic sort of discussions, guided discussions, get involved in active learning, discuss what the problems are that you encountered when you went through this material. And that, I think, it's long overdue. Um, it's kind of what we need to do. The, the knowledge requirements for functioning in medicine has evolved a lot since the time of William Osler, but how we teach it hasn't. So, <laughs> where to? When you first encounter social media, you look at all this stuff, it's like this, you know. The role of Twitter is seems to be people saying, I need to pee, Facebook, I peed, it's all these ridiculous things. I'm not so interested in what the tools are, but how you use them. And for me, Twitter has been amazing. For me, it's like a perpetual conference. I mean, I'm sure you're sharing with me, like, just the uh, euphoria and exhilaration, uh, talking to these like-minded people all the time, new ideas, all this stuff. That's what Twitter is all the time, if you follow the right people. It has the advantage, like, for instance, I'm sitting next to Oli Flower right now, um, it's hard for me to get up and leave without offending him, but on Twitter I can just unfollow him, he probably won't even know. Um, <laughs> and you can do you tie your tweets together with these things called hashtags, and they, that's what forms the conversations and, all, and, and makes these things useful. Twitter really took off in the recent um, International Conference of Emergency Medicine. There were um, thousands, and this was about a couple of days into a sort of a four or five day conference, it just exploded. I was in, um, I was walking around Uluru at the time, and I felt like I was at the conference, I was getting all these pearls, it was, you could really be part of it through social media. Um, but the other aspect that I, obviously I'm involved in, apart from Twitter, is, is the blog, the website, Life in the Fast Lane, which um, uh, is basically uh, largely me and Mike, but with the help of a lot of friends. And um, since we've got involved in that, it's really, really exploded. And it's just been one of the greatest experiences of my life. Um, we've had a whole lot of people, it really is a team effort, who are all doing it for the love of it. None of it's for money. It's all just for getting ideas and stuff out there and helping teach people, both in Australia, but also around the world, um, in developing countries and stuff as well. Um, some of the stuff we have on there is things like case-based question and answers where it's show hide answers, it's all active learning and people can respond and, and pull you up. There's nothing like putting something on here to find out the stuff that you don't know. And if you're the writer, you learn just as much as the people reading. We've also got our ECG library, which includes some ECGs never seen before. And it's a fantastic resource. And um, for instance, we recently got this comment from this guy called uh, uh, Nathji, who's a former Harvard physicist, who now lives in a remote area of the Himalayas, and bought himself an ECG because he wants to improve the health of his local community. And according to him, the ECG library is one of the greatest boons on the internet. And who am I to disagree? Yeah. We've also developed our own, um, uh, our own college, the uh, Utopian College of Emergency for Medicine. Now it's a bit like Kick'em Sick'em, do you call it Uck'em or Use'em? But regardless, becoming a fellow of this is a really exalted and uh, much looked after position. We're also um, developing new technologies like the, the first two-in-one taser defibrillator that fits in your carry-on luggage getting on the airplane. It's, um, it's amazing what you can do these days with technology. Life in the Fast Lane is really, really growing. We're now sort of getting more than 15,000 page views a day, probably getting closer to 20,000 per day. Um, but the important thing is we're not alone. And for the red, green, colour blind, there's a not there. We're not, <laughs> we're not alone. <laughs> okay. um, there's people, you might have heard of these guys, the Intensive Care Network. They've got it on the act. It's all good to see. Um, and there's lots of other things. Cliff Reed in Sydney does his research.
discussed me, keeps us up to date with the resuscitation literature. Um, in America now, there's this poem, ccm.org, which basically surveys the critical care literature with short summaries. Check that out, it'll save you a lot of time. Um, Leon Gusau, or I'm not, I hope I said his name right, does the same thing for toxicology with the Poison Review. Um, there's a great trauma professionals blog. Stephen Smith is uh, this incredible ECG guru who focuses in purely on ECGs. And, and that, it's all free, it's amazing. Um, and then there's also a podcast, Scott Weingart, who um, most people probably know about. Um, Joe Lex goes around the world to every conference he can, can with about 20 tape recorders and records every talk he can, and there's thousands of them on free online there. Um, and there's other podcasts like Jeffrey Guys on ICU Rounds and Matt and Mike, who are absolutely insane doing their ultrasound podcast. It's a good talk, I know. <laughs> and there's now over 130 of these emergency medicine critical care blogs worldwide in 17 countries. But the thing is, is that it's mostly emergency medicine. There's a lot of room for intensive care guys to come on in and get involved and, and make this really kick off. Because, you know, I think we can take the world by storm. Now, um, there's a danger when you look at all this stuff. We worry about information overload. But there's been information overload since the invention of the, the Gutenberg Press. Since books were around, it's all about filter failure. You need to make good filters. You need to know what you want to read. And we try to do this by every week. We have this thing called the, the Litful Review, where we just summarize all the blogs and stuff on there. So if you need a stepping point off, you're a bit nervous, you're still standing on the edge of the cliff, check that out and click on a few links and see what's out there. I've also um, tried to harness the power of social media to do this thing called um, uh, research and reviews. So a lot of people who I think are quite good all over the world, I say, hey, if you read a, if you read a paper that's um, uh, good, tell me about it and I'll stick it on there. So it gives them a chance to tell us about the papers that they think is worth reading. I think the, was the bird trying to eat the wire or something. But, um, and, yeah, and, and we've also made databases of everything so you can find the stuff you need when you, when you want it. If you're still not convinced, I'm going to take it home now. The, um, these are some more reasons why you need to get involved in this stuff. You need to create your own digital footprint. Go home, Google yourself, see what's on there. If you don't create your digital presence, somebody else will. And the easiest way to create a good digital footprint for yourself is by joining social media. Because they, they rise, those websites, if you have a Google Plus account, Google is going to put that highest on the, on, the, on the search thing when somebody searches for you. So that's one reason. It's amazing opportunities. I'm standing here. <laughs> if I was, wasn't doing life in the fast lane, I wouldn't be here, that, that's for sure. Um, the, uh, but more importantly, I think it can do for medicine what it's done for um, street dance, what it's done for skateboarding. People watching this, these videos of other people, what they do on YouTube, and then trying to do it better, it, it's just spiralled out of control. The world has just got unbelievably good at stuff because of this constant interaction and accelerated learning that results from it. And the bottom line is that the textbook is dead. Um, and journals are pretty close to dead as well, unless they evolve. Um, and the way that they're going to evolve is by adopting other um, social media type elements and become part of this, um, this revolution. I maybe wouldn't go all the way with Scott Weingarten saying this, but I think you know, there's a lot of people who say, well, I read all these journals and stuff. And look, you're probably fine if you do that and you're not doing social media. But there's, to be honest, you know, there's a lot of people who don't read a lot of papers, and social media is an easy way to do it, and you'll be, you'll be more up to date and, and on, the, on the right page than, than the people who are trawling through contents of journals. And let's face it, do you want to be reading books chained to the desk, or be on the move and learn in your downtime? It revolutionises going to the supermarket even though I still try and get out of it at every opportunity and usually succeed. Um, Joe Lex just gave a talk about a month ago that I've already listened on the, to on free emergency talks, uh, gave it in New York, and he said that um, if you want to know what medicine was like um, 
pa the practice of medicine was like 10 years ago, read a textbook. If you want to know what it was like two years ago, read a journal. If you want to know what it's like today, then go to a good conference. If you want to know what it's like in the future, listen in the hallways and use foam. And that's what I'm talking about now. Free open access education. On Twitter, the hashtag is hash foamed. It's, um, the con the, the, what we've been doing has been done for a while, but like I say, social media scares people off. Over a couple of Guinnesses in Ireland, Mike Cadogan and a couple others uh, sprang on the idea of foam as a, as a catchphrase to tie this all together, and it really seems to be catching on and taking off. Why would you make foam? It seems like a lot of effort, doesn't it? But let's go back to what we do currently. You give a talk, eight people are there. Half of them have just come off the night shift, they're falling asleep. The other half have just eaten their lunch, so they're also falling asleep. You do that talk, you put in maybe God knows how many hours into it. Why not record it, stick it online, and any you know thousands of people across the world can learn from this stuff? Why did you go into medicine? I mean, most people, some inkling of it is because they wanted to help people. This is a fantastic way to help people. And finally, um, if you're involved in education, you want to be an educator, um, well, I've certainly found there's no easier way to make your name as, a, as an educator. So for those reasons, get involved. So that's what I want you to do. Not pull my finger, but to go home and, uh, and get involved in this in some small way. Because it's fun and it works. And uh, we're about to see um, next year, smack, you've all heard about it, this is going to be like the physical embodiment of this and I think it's just going to be fantastic because um, we just need to get, get everybody, the people making it, the people using it, they're equally important, let's really kick on with it. And I'm sure that the late Peter Saffer would, uh, would approve. So thanks for listening to me, um, I'm sorry I went on for so long.